And there is a Spider-Man rock and roll album out there is that came really? out in the 70s. Yeah. And even DC did. Batman. Yeah, everybody knows the Batman theme. Batman. We found out years later, that's the inspiration for George Harrison's Tax Man. So it's like, then you go, oh, yeah. I'm a writer. I know dialogue. That's a fountain of conversation, man. That's a geyser. Interesting. Interesting. Yes, provocative. Oh, daddy, stand back, man. Woo! Rock and roll! Welcome to Booked on Rock, the podcast for those about to read and rock. Find the podcast at bookedonrock.com. Find every episode there, along with links to your favorite listening platforms, exclusive videos, blogs, links to all of the social media sites, and the latest rock book releases. It's another chapter in the Dialogue series, a chill and chat with authors, fellow podcasters, musicians, and more. Our guest is pop culture historian Mark Arnold. He's the author of several books about comic books, music, animation, and more. Among the books he's released, the best of the Harveyville fun times, focused on the comic book publisher Harvey Comics, created and produced by Total Television Productions, the story of Underdog, Tennessee Tuxedo, and the rest. If you're cracked, you're happy. The History of Crack Magazine, a two-volume set, followed in 2011. More recently, Arnold wrote, Mark Arnold picks on the Beatles, and Frozen in Ice, the story of Walt Disney Productions, 1966 to 1985. Along with a book on the Beatles, he's published books on the monkeys, including long title, Looking for the Good Times, examining the monkeys' songs one by one, and Headquartered, a timeline of the monkeys' solo years. Mark and I talk about the Chipmunks, the Beatles, the monkeys, some of Mark's other favorite classic rock bands and artists, and we detour into our favorite comic books, Disney past, present, and future, our love of the Three Stooges, and a whole lot more. So get ready for an animated discussion with Mark Arnold. Hey, Mark, welcome to the podcast. Great Good to, to be you. here. Thank you. Boy, you've had quite the career, man. You've written several books about comic books, about music and animation. Tell us where all this began. When did you become a fan of pop culture and what led you to a career as a writer? Geez, probably my whole life. I started off with cartoons and TV shows and things like that. And then eventually evolved into music and movies and anything else in general pop culture. No aspirations per se of writing about this stuff. I just... As a kid, I'd keep lists of things, like I'd keep lists of Beatles albums or Rolling Stones albums or whatever, and yeah, just for my own private use. And then over time, after college and everything like that, fanzines were a big thing in the 80s and 90s, not so much now. And I had a friend that did a Rocky and Bullwinkle fanzine, and I go, oh, that's kind of neat. How do you do that? And I asked him all these questions. And then I said, what can I do a fanzine on? I thought about Disney. I thought about a few other things. And I kept thinking, if I do something big like Disney or Beatles or something, they'd probably sue me or something. I, I was pretty young and naive and everything, so I didn't know. So my first wife said, you like Harvey Comics, why don't you do that? And I go, well, there isn't anything written about Harvey Comics. And then I thought about it and go, well, that might make it better because <laughs> it's not like I can make it up, but at the same time, I can't be chastised if I got it wrong. You know, it's like I'm learning over time, you know, like if I start with Beatles, people would say, that's not what John did that day. And Paul didn't do that. Oh, you know, it's like, yeah, you Beatles know, fans so, know their Beatles trivia. <laughs> yeah. So Harvey, for people who don't know Harvey comics, they're the Casper, the Richie Rich, those type of comic books for children. And I just grew to love them and, then I became like their major historian after doing the fanzine for so long. And I eventually wrote a book about it. It wasn't the original plan, but eventually I said, you know, I know all this knowledge. And I did two books on Harvey. One was the best of the fanzine. And the second was the Harvey Comics Companion. And it's literally the entire history of the company. So, Yeah, Harvey's had quite a history. I want to ask you about that. I want mm -hmm. to ask you about your books on the monkeys and there's one on the Beatles, but mm -hmm. I figured I'd pick out a few of the other books that you've written that really stand out for me around this time of year. Of course, we hear the chipmunk song released on December 1st, 1958. And in 2019, you released that book there titled yeah. Alvin. Yes, it's a long <laughs> title, but the Alvin is the yeah. key thing. The story of Ross Magnusarian senior. That's him. Liberty records, which is a label he mainly recorded for format films, which is the animation studio that did the album show and the album show itself, which did these versions of the chipmunks, unlike later ones, which were done by his son and his wife. He had 
a record label, Liberty Records, that was about ready to go belly up. And long story short, I suppose, is he invested like $200 of the family's money, which was a lot in the 50s, for a multi-speed reel-to-reel tape recorder so you could vary speed and speak slowly and play it back faster, which gives you that chipmunk voice. And the initial thing wasn't the chipmunks. The initial thing he did was this item that actually was a big hit, too, called Witch Doctor. And the only bit that he did that was kind of sped up was the catchphrase of ooh, ee, ooh, ah, ah, ting, tang, walla, walla, bing, bang, you know. <laughs> and it was done sped up, which sounded kind of chipmunk-like. And, of course, since that was a major hit and helped Liberty out of the hole, they said, do more, do more and more, you know. The next record immediately after wasn't the Chipmunks again. He did other records and everything, but probably about three or four records later, he hit set upon the idea of doing the Chipmunk song and writing an actual authentic Christmas song that has been covered, not Chipmunk wise, but it's actually a decent song. And did three voices, his own voices. You know, one was kind of high, one was kind of low, and one was in the middle. And then at a different speed, he did his own voice yelling at them. <laughs> and uh, history was born. And he considered doing grasshoppers and other different creatures, but he settled upon chipmunks. And there's two different stories about it. One is that he was driving his car and there's a chipmunk in the road that was kind of daring him to run over him. That's the lore, but I don't know. I think it's a little more basic than that. It just was like, oh, well... Disney had like Chip and Dale and they had kind of sped up voices and that's probably what it sounded like. Let's do that. It not only saved his career, I mean, he made a fortune, didn't he? Oh, yeah. From that point on. If he didn't do any more records but those two, he would have been set for life. But he continued and they did a number of Chipmunks albums and singles and everything. Some were big hits also, like Alvin's Harmonica, Alvin's Orchestra. And he even met up with Brian Epstein and agreed to do a Beatles album. And that was a success too, the Chipmunks sing the Beatles hits. So I remember that. And I don't know where I think the <laughs> album's gone, but when I was a little kid, I remember my older brother playing that or my, my dad or my older brother playing that album. And it was all <laughs> Beatles songs, I believe. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was a whole album. It, it was pretty straight. It wasn't as silly or whatever as the other ones. About the only time there was any humor is, I think at one point he says, Alvin, you're, your wig's slipping a little, you know, and that was that. it. But for the most part, they are pretty straight covers and and not badly sung or orchestrated. So, is it still available, or is it out of print? Uh, currently, probably not. But I mean, it's been on CD, it's been on vinyl for years. So, I mean, it's not that hard to come by. Man, that's so. a blast from the past. I mean, I tell you, I can't remember might be on Spotify. I don't know. <laughs> it might be. I'm gonna I'm gonna look it up now. But man, that takes me back to when I was really young, and I remember that particular album now was he mm-hmm. part of all like the any any of the future cartoon series anything like that was he well the issue was he passed away pretty young in 1972 he had a sudden heart attack strangely enough during the super bowl he, he kind of retired the chipmunks act about 1969 anyway it kind of run its course throughout the 60s and that was it his son ross jr took up the slack and said there's got to be more mileage out of this stuff but it took him almost a decade to kind of get anybody interested in doing a new animated series and doing a new album and things like that. And what finally kind of clicked is there was a radio station in Los Angeles that played, I think it was Blondie's Call Me at the wrong speed. And the DJ jokingly said, that's the new Chipmunks record. <laughs> and uh, People called in thinking it really was, and it wasn't. But since the seed had been planted, he'd been shopping it around to different labels and everything. They called him back and they said, can you do a Chipmunks album with different current rock songs? Yeah, sure. And when he came back with was Chipmunk Punk, although <laughs> not all the songs on it were really punk. They were just kind of standard rock and roll songs from the late 70s. But it launched it all over again. And by the way, the Chipmunks sing the Beatles hits. Yeah, 1964. 1964 wow all music gives it four out of five stars <laughs> that's <laughs> well great. like i said it's not badly sung unless you just cannot stand sped up chipmunks voices and it's also <laughs> not badly performed i forgot the band it's it's listed in the book who oh recorded yeah it who, who in, recorded it yeah yeah and actually it's a singing group which is mentioned in the book it, uh, by this point when that album came out ross did not do the singing himself he figured he should 
lend it out to professionals who actually could sing. And so that's why it sounds pretty good. <laughs> oh, man, I love it. Let's talk about Harvey Comics. You published the book in 2017 titled The Harvey Comics Companion. And the yeah. promo for the book reads, quote, Harvey Comics, the name conjures up images of characters such as Casper, the friendly ghost, and Richie Rich the poor little rich boy adorning small TV sets alongside the spine of their comic books. But the Harvey story was much, much more. Tell us a little bit about Alfred Harvey and his amazing company, the Harvey Comics Companion. Alfred Harvey was born Alfred Harvey Wiernikoff. The family came from Russia and came through Ellis Island. There was an older brother that came with the parents named Robert and they arrived in the early 1900s. I'm going way back, but this is in the book. And the two twin younger brothers were Alfred and Leon. Alfred was always interested in publishing and worked for newspapers, did little spot illustrations and editorial cartoons and things like that. Eventually landed into the comic book industry and worked for a number of other publishers for a bit, one called Fox and a couple others. And then decided to step out on his own in the late 30s, early 40s, and acquired some other comics like Speed Comics and Champ Comics, just standard superhero titles of the day. Nothing remarkable about any of the characters in him, although he created a character that was probably their most successful superhero character, a character named the Black Cat. It was a female superhero kind of daredevil type person and could perform acrobatics and things like that. That really kind of launched the company along with acquiring licenses for characters such as the Green Hornet, Joe Palooka, which is a newspaper strip, lots of other newspaper strips. Eventually they got Blondie, Blondie and Dagwood and that uh, Dick Tracy, Lil Abner, all sorts of newspaper strips. They would branch off into different genres. They did romance for a while, war titles and horror titles. And if you know your comic book history, by the early 1950s, they were starting to clamp down on too much horror and crime and things in comic books. And fortunately, Alfred Harvey was able to secure the license for the animated cartoons by famous studios, which Paramount Pictures owned. And they did the Casper, the Friendly Ghost, and the Laudry, Baby Huey, things like that. And so they just put out comic books of those along with the rest of their lineup as. They started clamping down on the horror comics. Those ceased publication. And over time, those other Harvey characters just took over and were like their main success. And then they added ones that they created, like Richie Rich, Little Lotta, a few others. So they had a stable of like little kid characters and ghost and witch characters and duck characters that kind of lived in the Harvey land and kind of made its own world. And basically published straight through the early 90s. Um, then they sold the company. They made feature films. It goes through every phase in this book. So but that's it went how that up works. through, what, 2002? The book itself goes up all the way to 2017 when it came out. But as but far as... Harvey uh, Comics, uh, didn't it go... The comics, they published straight through till 94. But they did occasional movie tie-ins and things. Probably about... Even as recently as, even after my book is published, there's this other company licensing it out. I mean, it's been bought and sold by a few different companies since, and it's now owned by NBC Universal. all those characters. And the most recent publisher, which they're not publishing now, they had like a three-year license, was American Mythology. So Here's a small world story. My dad's yeah. uncle, Mike Senich, was one of the artists for the Cats and Jammer mm. kids. <laughs> Do you remember mm. that? That strip, yeah, and yeah. Uh, Harvey did publish it for a time. Did he? Okay. Uh, yeah, not too long, but it, it was mainly published by another publisher, Dell, for a number of years and okay. things like that. But, yeah. And it was mainly a newspaper strip. It didn't do incredibly well in comic books. It was sometimes a filler in the back of a other right. comic. He was in the late 70s, and my dad used to tell me stories. I think he would go visit him in New York. And he had yeah. all his boards out there. And really cool. Wow. Yeah, really But that cool. strip has incredible longevity. It was over... 100 years old at one point. I think they are total reprints now, or they don't do any more now, but it lasted for over 100 years before they stopped making new ones. So that's, that's cool. Incredible run. Another yeah. another pop culture mind blow. My dad's cousin was Bob Grain, Colonel Hogan. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They look just like each other, too. It was pretty wild. Small world. 
Are you a fan of superhero comics? Do you? I have am. I don't really follow the current stuff. And what do you think yeah. of the movies that are out? I like the original Marvel ones that went all the way through, like when they had the uh, Avengers one that kind of, that was kind of the conclusion for me. And I know they put out more recent ones. I did see Guardians of the Galaxy 3, but a lot of the most recent ones, like the Marvels that just came out and a few others, I, I've tried to keep up with them, but it's it's harder for me to kind of maintain the momentum of it all. I don't, I mean, I'm not obligated to see them. So, I mean, I see what I can but yeah, I've seen I mean, a, a goodly amount of them. I'll say that. <laughs> same here, yeah. but there's a burnout factor now. So yeah, for me, yeah. it's, it's okay. I think the last one that just came out, there was a headline that said it actually didn't do that well in the box office. Yeah. Well, I think it was the Marvels, the one that I was saying. That's And then there's Aquaman too. That's on DC though. So That's on um, DC. Yeah. Are you a Marvel or yeah. DC Comics guy? As a kid, I always preferred Marvel because I thought it was a little more hip. And I was a kid more in the 70s and 80s. I thought it was a little more hip, but over the time I've grown to appreciate DC stuff, but I would buy almost anything on the stands growing up. You know? So I always regularly bought Superman and Batman as well as Spider-Man and Fantastic Four. Those were like the four main ones of superhero stuff. And then every so often I'd grab Daredevil or Captain yeah. America or whatever, but they didn't thrill me as much as the ones I just mentioned. So I always love Marvel. Yeah. I always found there was a distinct difference in the storylines between DC and Marvel. There was a difference in the writing style. Well, traditionally, they were also very self-contained, too. Marvel was the one that kind of introduced like the, the soap opera element where continued next issue, or, you know, it's like you're reading X-Men, this will be continued in Thor, you know, or something like that. It's like this one big universe. Yeah. yeah, well, yeah I'm, just, I'm just pulling out my old, my old Spider-Mans here. <laughs> These are pretty wild. These are from 1986. Yeah. Yeah. Summer of 86. I bought a ton of Spider Man. Yeah. I was still buying them. I probably bought regularly, probably until about 20 years ago. And now, now the weird thing, I still go to the comic stores and I buy back issues or whatever, but they are doing a lot of reprints of key issues from the past. And they have the original advertising and it's on a better paper stock sometimes. It cost more than 12 cents or whatever the original price was, but there's still a bargain than going back through time and buying some gold or silver age thing for a thousand bucks. It's yeah. nice to get for four to six bucks somewhere around there. Stan Lee, <laughs> he was like the Alfred Hitchcock of comic book <laughs> movies. He was in every one. <laughs> yeah. But he had, a, there was a partner, I'm, I, you would know this more than me now. I know there was, a, there was another guy who was part of the history of Spider-Man that well, there's more not... than just one other guy, but the okay. two, the two was, main ones. There was a little resentment towards Stan because he was getting yeah. all the credit. Yeah, one's Jack Kirby, and he did yeah. most of the illustrations. That's probably who you're thinking of. He did. He typically illustrated Fantastic Four and Captain America and a few others. The other one, Steve Ditko, did Spider-Man Doctor Strange. Those are the ones that quibbled the most about Stan hogging all the credit. I try to keep out of arguments like that. There's a lot of people who claim that Kirby and Ditko did everything and the other people did everything. Stan did absolutely nothing. I don't think that's absolutely correct. Did Stan Lee take advantage of his situation? Well, yeah, probably. But I don't think that if it's just like in any other situation, I keep mentioning Beatles. If any one of the Beatles was out of that group, I don't think they would have been as successful without all four of them. So it's the same thing with these Marvel comics. I mean, Jack Kirby went on, did a number of titles for DC. They were nowhere nearly as successful as anything he did at Marvel. So Stan Lee, I feel, had something to do with that. I can't believe he was just sitting there and they're raking all the profits and the glory and everything and not doing a darn thing. So it's like... He also uh, had, a, he had a great yeah. personality. When I was a kid, I loved watching the cartoon series. This is Stan Lee. You know, he did yeah. the voiceover. I, I yeah. loved that. Yeah. yeah. And if anything, some people poo poo that. It's like, well, if that's what it took to get us all interested in it, hey, they're true believers. This is Stan Lee. That's it. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. If you do all that and that works to get you interested, well, he did something. To put it into perspective, because this is a classic rock podcast, it's like having a 
a super talented band, but you don't have anybody in the band to go out and promote it. Like you got to have that great front man to go out there and do all the interviews and say, Hey, this is my band. You got to check us out. Yeah. It's, it's and, and in a certain respect, Stan Lee was a rock star. I mean, and, sure. and they did devil and rock and roll. I mean, there is a Spider-Man rock and roll album out there is that there came really? out in the seventies. Yeah. They did occasional songs that were kind of rock oriented. I think there's a Hulk song and, and the various theme songs of the TV shows and stuff like that. So oh, that's know. awesome. And even DC did, you know, it was Batman. Yeah. Everybody knows the Batman theme. Dun, 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 Batman. Yes. And we found out years later, that's the inspiration for George Harrison's tax man. So it's like, then you go, Oh yeah. Yeah. Isn't that cool? <laughs> you have a great podcast. You had a guest on, who wrote a book on Shemp of the Three Stooges. And I love Shemp. So let's talk Three Stooges. You released a comic book on the Three Stooges, Mary Stoogemus. Yeah. That was well, I mentioned uh, the comic book publisher, American Mythology, earlier in the show. They weren't just publishing Harvey books. They also licensed other books. And one of the licensees is Three Stooges. I was writing for that company for a time and managed to get a few scripts published. One of them was the Three Stooges one. It was just difficult getting things published because everything had to pass through certain levels. It had to go through C3 Entertainment, which is the company that represents the Stooges today. Just all these hurdles and everything. So I'm happy I got a few stories published, but man, it was a lot of work for really? not, yeah? not okay. so much pay. So, you know, I, I like the thing. At least I got a Three Stooges story. At least I got a Pink Panther story going. At least I got a couple others going. You know, it's like, but, man, um, I, I had a friend in high school. <laughs> He was recording all of the Three Stooges episodes on VHS, <laughs> and then he sold them. Was there a Three Stooges fan newsletter or something, I think? And he, oh, yeah, there still is. Yeah. He advertised them in the back. Not the <laughs> smartest thing to do. And he was selling them, and he got a cease and desist, and he Ooh, was scared yeah. shitless. You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> yeah. okay, this is serious. Are there family members that have... Yeah, well, the the company that owns them is run by the descendants of the Three Stooges. Actually, the two heads, this is kind of ironic, because during most of their career, Mo was like the leader, you know. Yeah. But strangely enough, over time, just of how organizational and who wants to work on it and everything, they created C3 Entertainment. I think the Stooges themselves actually created it first, if memory serves. And then when they passed on, it went to their heirs. And now the descendants of Curly Joe, who wasn't even original Three Stooges, they are the actual people who run the company. And they go through all the licensing deals. They have to approve anything that comes out, whether it's a little glass jar or, you know, a comic book story or whatever. Anything with the images of the Stooges on it has to pass through them to approve that this is something we want stooges being represented by like you couldn't put it on some adult entertainment thing or something like yeah that. right right you know, well at least it's know. in the family name because i saw that yeah. bob ross documentary on netflix and yeah bob, but bob ross's son that poor guy he has no say in any he doesn't get any money from yeah, that's terrible <laughs> from, so at least it's in good hands but I, shemp was always my favorite because he was i could relate to him so much like he's just a worry war always nervous mm -hmm. always afraid he's gonna screw something up you had Jeff Dale, who wrote a, a book called Shemp Howard, Much More Than a Stooge. He was on your the Fun Ideas podcast. we got to get right. mm -hmm. plugged. So I want to know who your favorite stooge is and why. It is Shemp now. Shemp you know, I, I, think, I think what it is is, you know, I think most people do this. I mean, not everyone, but if you like Shemp now, you may or may not have always liked him. Because it seems like when you're really young and you first experience stooges, Curly is the one because he's he's like a big kid kidding himself and woo, woo, and all that stuff and then but over time it's not like Shemp was more sophisticated but he was different and he, he kind of he had a many years work in this Shemp book actually talks about it. he had many years working as a solo act working with Abbott and Costello and a bunch of other people WC Fields and all that stuff so he had quite a few years of honing his own talent and fortunately when he came back to the stooges he was allowed to do things his own way not just imitate curly <laughs> and uh, i think that's why he's become beloved just because he's kind of his own thing <laughs> in a certain respect it, it was a great physical comic yeah curly of course i mean he was he was the man you know he was the yeah. he was the star but that's the thing about the stooges not much is known about them 
off camera and other mm-hmm. books and documentaries on them. But well, Mo was a serious one because, like you say, he was the guy that handled the business affairs. Larry just did whatever Mo asked. Yeah. <laughs> and, but I know Curly, he lived to excess and he yeah. had a stroke fairly young, right? I mean, he, I don't even think yeah. he was 50 by the time right. he had um, a stroke. He actually passed away before he was 50. He was like 48, I think. Apparently, he had a series of smaller strokes when he was in his early 40s, but they just kind of ignored it because the Stooges thing was kind of like a machine. Once they got started with Columbia Pictures, they just kept churning them out like a TV series. And then when they weren't filming the shorts, they were on tour. And on one of my other podcast episodes, I had Gary Lassen, who's president of the Three Stooges Fan Club and the Stooges Museum. And he wrote this excellent book that talks about all their touring years. And you see some years in the late 30s and early 40s, I mean, they're on stage every single day of the year, practically. It's like, how'd they have time to film the the movies and everything like that? And then after Curly got sick, you see the personal appearances starting to go down to, like, nothing. And then Shemp came in, and then they started going back up, and then it went back down again. And then they had Curly Joe later on, and once again, a rise. And then well, it by wasn't until Curly 60s, Joe when they made money, right? They, yeah, they weren't yeah. getting much of a cut on profits until was the 50s or 60s or when was curly joe that was the, the 60s 59 is when he came in 59, and that was the okay. big year where it all changed where it, you know they're barely scraping by well and mainly because they had the same contract from 1934 to 1957 they just renew it annually they didn't give them raises or anything it was crazy and harry Cohn, the head of columbia pictures he had them under a tight grip he didn't want them going out there making feature films and stuff like that to just still what they're doing. You know, meanwhile, Abbott and Costello, Laurel and Hardy, all these other people, they're graduating to feature film status and becoming big stars. And they're still making shorts way into the late 50s. And yeah. there's that wild piece of Stooges trivia that Curly is in an episode post stroke and he's yeah. on a train. And yeah. you probably, what's the t- title of the episode? It's Lying on a I Train. I forget the name of it. Yeah. But you it's know, it's that. it's just surreal to see because he's on a train and his hat is down over his eyes and he's not curly like he's just supposed to be just some regular dude on the train but he's doing his you know he's right doing his thing, but it's it's yeah. so bizarre because yeah. that's the most he was able to do yeah. at that time and I guess they're trying to encourage him to come back you know nobody knows officially why. But they thought, I guess they always thought he would get back to normal and Shemp would go on his merry way and Curly would come back into the act. But But he couldn't talk, right? Yeah, I I don't know, but I don't think he, I I think he slurred a lot what I've read in later years. And then, of course, he had a couple major strokes that just turned him into a vegetable, basically, I hate to say. So he had to go into what they used to call an asylum, sanitarium and things like that. And eventually, they didn't have this term back then when he was on hospice and things like that. And so, it must have been excruciating watching him deteriorate while they had sure. to keep going on making new films. You sure. Know? You mentioned Disney quickly. Let's talk about Disney because another book that you wrote is 2013's Frozen in Ice, the story of Walt Disney Productions, 1966 to 1985. And you explore the major accomplishments of Walt Disney Productions during those years. And it was in the mid-70s when ideas start to run thin and repetition sets in, the box office numbers start to drop. By the 80s, threats of corporate takeover were knocking at their door, so things had to change. Can you talk about the changes that took place and why Disney is the empire that it is today? The seeds of that were sown then. Had Disney just kind of remained reasonably successful and not susceptible to a corporate buyout, like the way things work these days with capitalism and everything, (laughs) they probably would just continue on just as a second rate studio in later years because they didn't have that guiding force of Walt Disney and turning out lightweight comedies and musicals and cartoons. The problem was they kept going at that pace for 20 years. And by the end of it, they were prime for the picking that there's people wanting to buy Disney lock, stock, and barrel, and then piecemeal it out. So the thought was, you know, you buy Disney, you sell the animation off to one person, you sell the 
park stuff to somebody else. You sell the live action part to somebody else and the TV stuff to somebody else. And that's the end of Disney. That kind of is what happened with Harvey. Since we talk about Harvey, you know, it's like it just kind of got gobbled up by some other entity. So Disney fought back and there's a lengthy book story about all the corporate rating and everything that I, I reference in my book. It's called Storming the Magic Kingdom. That really goes into the story well of what happened there. But basically, Disney had to do what needed to be done because for the longest time, Disney just kind of rested on its laurels. They were making successful films. Even kind of lame stuff was still being successful until the main thing that kind of changed everything, which now, 40 years later, is rather ironic, is Star Wars. Because Star Wars is the game changer for everything for what's considered children's or family entertainment, if you prefer, or even young adult entertainment. When Disney tried to keep up, they they released things like the Black Hole, which were kind of bad imitations of what went down. And so they're in serious trouble at that point because they were no longer a leader trying new things. They were a follower. So eventually Michael Eisner came in there. There was a lengthy situation of how they brought him in. Eisner had a track record of working for ABC Television and also at Paramount Pictures. I always like to say jokingly, but it is kind of true. He kind of turned Disney into Paramount. Instead of doing everything in-house where you do all your pictures on the back lot and they all kind of look the same and they have the same actors and everything like that, he just changed around to like any other studio where they had more pictures coming out per year with any actor you could sign and they no longer were afraid to put out R-rated films if they needed to and get the big name stars that they needed to and they sacrificed the little homey atmosphere of Disney but it was far more successful monetarily one of the fortunate byproducts is that they also turned around their animation there's a great documentary called Waking Sleeping Beauty that talks about that where they're making kind of random bad animated pictures by the mid 80s and then they got some musical songwriters in there that their first big success well they did little shop of horrors for another studio and then the big success at disney was little mermaid and that kind of turned everything around then they did beauty and the beast lion king pocahontas all these different ones uh tarzan whatever and they were all big run of successful animated films and it turned all that around over time they turned everything around the parks got bigger they opened more theme parks they started a cruise line they did more and more live action films more sequels and things like that so then they had the clout and the money to go after the things like star wars originally george lucas actually went to disney and say hey would you put out my film and they oh, back said, in the mid 70s yeah, you're talking about back oh, in the okay. mid 70s and the pro- the reason why lucas walked away with it and went to 20th century fox eventually is because disney wanted to produce it all in house they wanted to use their own talent they wanted to use their own engineers and whatever imagineers whatever but lucas wanted to do his own thing he eventually formed what became ilm that's what he wanted to do and disney was like no 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 we do it all here we don't do it out there big mistake fortunately i guess the good part and bad part is that now disney owns star wars but lucas went back and offered it to disney and that's what happened and then they eventually got indiana jones and they eventually got marvel and they eventually got yeah. all this other stuff But they're also in trouble because they've been acquiring, acquiring, acquiring. The problem is that they aren't putting out a lot of original type films anymore. They're just remaking live action versions of their animated hits. And a few Mm. of those are all right, but not everybody wants to see that. Do you think they might be headed back to where they were back in the mid 80s? Well, that's a stretch. The most recent thing I've heard about is that there's talks that they might buy another studio or something like that. And it's like, Wow, how could you get even bigger? There probably needs to be some sort of change in management. Bob Iger has been in there a while, and it seems to happen with all the managers since Walt himself, is if they're in there too long, they tend to distort what the Disney brand is. I don't know why. Eisner did it too. And it no longer is like growing. It's just stagnating, and they start making odd choices that don't make any sense. So... It probably needs some sort of shakeup. I don't know if Disney needs to keep all the different things. They might be good to 
sell off Marvel comics. There's no real reason they need them. I mean, especially if the movies aren't making money for them again. But it's hard to tell right now. They're still successful enough, but who knows? But that might be the first thing to go. I doubt they would get rid of Star Wars right away. They might actually piecemeal it out like the, was the plan in the 80s. They could sell off the parks to somebody else, or they could sell off the cruise line, or they could sell off the movies. You know, who knows? The Book Done Rock podcast will be back after this. Mark Arnold is our guest. He is a pop culture historian, the host of the podcast called The Fun Ideas Podcast, and the author of many, many books, including <laughs> ones on the monkeys and the Beatles, which I want to ask you about. But let's get into some of the books on rock that you've read and you want to read about and what you'd like to see written. You've read many music books, autobiographies, and biographies from some of the best. Pete Townsend, Roger Daltrey, Keith Richards, Frank Zappa, Chuck Negron, Led Zeppelin, The Doors, countless about the Beatles. Is there one book that stands out above the rest? I know the Keith Richards one is, I believe, the best selling of them all, but do you have one that really stands out? I think the two from The Who, that's probably why I listed them first, the Pete Townsend autobiography and the Roger Daltrey autobiography. They're both fun reads, interesting twists and turns in their life, especially with Townsend because he was accused of child pornography at one point and yeah. odd things like that. And he discusses it very bluntly. There's a lot of good ones. I can't, I can't really think of bad ones because they really, if it's really bad, I stop reading. And right. I don't continue. Is the who uh, your favorite band or the, uh, the no Beatles are, yeah, but yeah. Uh, you know, who's up there. They wrote well, the books are written well. So yeah. that's why they're funny and everything. So that's, that's what glues me in is if it's funny and good stories and things like that. What's fascinating is that Roger Daltrey, Pete Townsend relationship, the creative relationship there, do they get into the dynamics between the two? Yeah. Because that whole songwriting process is like Townsend comes in with the music. Daltrey's the voice that Townsend always wanted. Well, the funny thing is the Townsend book came out first. So when Daltrey's book came out, he had a chance. He had read Townsend's book. So he got to respond to some of the things that Townsend said. Now, they weren't really nasty. It's just that Daltrey remembered them differently. <laughs> so yeah, well, got and, they, and they had some oh, nasty yeah. moments. I mean, there yeah, was... they did have nasty moments. And <laughs> there was, you a, know, and Daltrey during, um, Tommy, defended think... himself saying why he did a certain thing at a certain time. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, when they were young, yeah, he, he was prone to punch people. I was just during Tommy <laughs> sessions. You know? Yeah, yeah. He I mean, Townsend. Back, uh, <laughs> anything there either. I mean, that's one thing I like too, is where they don't mind owning up to what they did. You know, it's like, so that makes for a good read too. So. Well, what about the Beatles? Tons of Beatles books. Is there one tons or Beatles two books. that really stand out to you? Strangely enough, other than the big Beatles anthology, oversized one, none of the books written by any of the Beatles themselves are really that good. I Me, Mine by George comes closest to being a decent book. The rest of them are kind of frivolous and silly to being Lennon's in his own right and Spaniard in the works, which is just silly poetry and stuff like that. It's fun to read. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but if Lennon stayed living, he might have done an autobiography. Who knows? Even McCartney, McCartney lyrics. I just actually got that book and read through it. And there were some news stories that I had not heard before, but he explains the most interesting part of the book is the forward introduction or whatever that he writes. Why have I never done an autobiography? You'd think Paul McCartney would love to write about his whole career and set the record straight and say his side of everything, but he just kind of like, eh not really interested fair enough but it's just kind of odd well, mick jagger uh, just recently said the same thing somebody asked yeah. him did you ever want to write a book yeah. keith wrote one would you and he just has no interest so the best books about the beatles are written by other people probably the best bio might be the love you make by peter brown george martin's book's decent for his side of things as far as authors overall of just the whole beatles experience I like anything Mark Lewison has written. I like anything yeah. Bruce Spicer has written. It kind of goes from there. Certain books are fun, like Pete Best wrote a book, you know, things like that. Yeah. Certain. Ken Womack was just on to talk about the book on Mal Evans. Really mm -hmm. good book on Mal. Yeah. Yeah. Sad I want to get that book. I don't have it. Yeah. Yeah. Sad. And I sad know about ending. the ending. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, really good book. Really good. But there's so many Beatles books. And it's amazing. Yeah. There's so many more that will be coming out. You just know. I mean, it's just the endless fascination with the Beatles that continues right. books you want to read you'd love to read about the cow sills which is mm -hmm. interesting cow sills there's a harvey comics connection there isn't there yes yeah 
the sons of Alfred Harvey, he had four sons in the mid-60s, huge, huge Cow Sills fans. And they knew Archie was successful with their comic books and stuff and doing Archie's band and stuff like that. It's like, why can't we have a band at Harvey Comics? And their dad, who was older, was like totally not into rock and roll or music or anything like that. He was probably more into like Sinatra or something like that. So I guess to throw their kids a bone, managed to secure a license to do one issue of a Cow Sills comic book. It's not a bad comic book. I mean, uh, if you've seen other comic books based on pop bands like the Monkees comic book, it's kind of silly. I mean, later Harvey, not Alfred Harvey, but the Harvey successors did a number of comic books on New Kids on the Block. And there's a Partridge Family comic book. They inspired the Partridge Family TV show. Yes, definitely. Yeah. There is a good documentary on the Castles. I just haven't read the book yet, but... The documentary is very tragic, unfortunately, but it's very good. I don't know the exact name of it, but it came out about 10 years ago or something like that. Yeah, one book you want to read that I was hoping to have him on, it didn't happen. They sent me the book, Mark Volman's new book about the turtles. When we were working on having him come on, he was just about to go out on tour, so he couldn't do it. You're toying with the idea of a book about Three Dog Night, is that? Well, yeah. Can I say my turtles book though? Oh, you know, oh well, let's uh, talk yeah. about that yeah, yeah. one. The, Let, that let's, one's... let's back up and talk about that first. Yeah, <laughs> the, the turtles book. Uh, Tell us about this one. I have this friend named Charles Rosenay. He's a big Beatles guy too. Oh yeah, he's from yeah, Connecticut. Yeah. Okay, he's, he's been on the yeah, show. Yeah, we, bo- we okay. both went to the same college together. We were laughing. Oh okay. <laughs> I knew of Charles way back in the early '80s when he started Good Day Sunshine. His fan scene. But back then, I was in my teens, early 20s, whatever, and I just subscribed to it. I wasn't even trying to become his friend or anything. But he seemed like a likable enough fellow, but I just never talked to him. I was on the West Coast, still am. He's on the East Coast, and, you know, just read his fanzine and everything like that. Then years later, with all this Zoom and podcast during the pandemic and everything, we had this mutual friend who's in Australia who goes by the name of Plastic EP. And he has both of us on there talking about the monkeys. And we just hit it off, just cracking jokes and everything at the expense of everyone else on the show. And so he says, hey, Mark, can I call you after the podcast? And I go, sure. And so we talked for like three hours afterwards. And I said, man, I should have recorded this. That would have been a great podcast. But and he has been on my podcast since. But you know, we were just getting to know each other and we just became fast friends and Eventually got around to discussion of writing books. How do you do it? He's never written a book before. He'd only published the fanzine and stuff like that. He eventually got his top 10 horror list book out and his top 10 Beatles list. And then I collaborated on my two monkeys books with a a man named Michael A. Ventrella. And we all three became friends. And then Charles asked me, well, if you could do another book, what would you want to do? Because you've done Beatles and Monkeys. And I go, you know, actually, my favorite group, apart from those, is the Turtles. But nobody seems to know them other than Happy Together, you know. And he goes, I love that group. And it's like, well, do you know them well enough that you could write about them? Because liking them and actually knowing them, it turned out to work well. And we did a number of interviews on my podcast that he arranged with various people that were either in the Turtles, like Chip Douglas or John Barbada, things like that, and Howard Kalin, or there are people that were around the Turtles, like the founder of Woodstock. In later years, the Turtles came back and they did various reunion tours, I mean, even now. And so we've interviewed people that were like the drummer in the group and different people like that that weren't in the original 60s band, but they were in these later touring incarnations. So they still had stories to tell. So those are all interviews in this book. So eventually we reviewed all the songs. We went not just Turtle songs, but also their alter egos of Flo and Eddie and the stuff they did with Frank Zappa and even the children's records that they did. They did some children's records of Strawberry Shortcake and G.I. Joe. (laughs) And we got pretty much anybody we could get. The holdouts, unfortunately, were Mark Fullman. We found out because he was working on his book, so we couldn't get him. But we secured the rights to an interview he did a few years back with these two women that interviewed him specifically about the children's albums. And they said, yeah, you can reprint that. So we used their interview in that case. The only other person that was kind of MIA and still is, and nobody seems to get him, 
Al Nickel, who was the guitarist throughout the original Turtles run, but he's very, he didn't even appear in the Turtles documentary that Rhino Records made years ago. He's still around, but he doesn't do interviews. He doesn't perform even anymore. So, oh, well, but we tried to talk to as many people. We talked to people, like I said, that knew him like the Spanky McFarland from Spanky and Our Gang, the the music group, not the <laughs> not right. the film series and things like that. So, and Jerry Yester, who was in the Love and Spoonful in the later years and actually was producing the Turtles' last album before they broke up and never got released at the time, but got released later, things like that. But the book, it has not come out yet. It's not it- come out as of this moment uh, when we're recording this. This coming weekend, I have to go through final edits of it, meaning okay. they've placed all the photos in and there's a few missing or something or we're going to rearrange it, but it's just like the final edits just to catch mistakes and change a few photos. And then it should go to press if I can get it done quickly enough sometime early next year. Cool. Wow. I don't have an exact date yet, but it's through Genius Publishing is, okay. and they well, publish other music books. Do you have a place to plug it? You're welcome back in, in January or whatever it comes Hopefully out. I'll have something I can hold up. Yeah, right. I do have the kind of, we did get Henry Diltz, who is a photographer from the 60s who photographed everyone, it seemed like. His most famous thing probably was the Crosby, Stills, Nash cover where they're sitting on the couch on the front. But he did a number of Turtles photo shoots where he took them out in the field. And some of the shots were used on one of their albums called Turtle Soup and stuff like that. But there's like rolls and rolls of photos he never used. And they're just in his archive. But So we got a couple photos to use, one for the back and one for the front, that has never been published anywhere before. So with his blessing. Now, Three Dog Night, you're a big fan of Three Dog Night. Yeah, yeah. And that was one thing Charles and I were considering doing as a follow-up. It might not be an immediate follow-up, but I always kind of like Three Dog Night. In fact, I mentioned to somebody earlier today about the same thing. Three Dog Night was kind of like the Taylor Swift (laughs) of their day. You know, there's a time in the early 70s where they were always on. Every record they put out was a big hit for about five years there. Then it all went away. One of the books I mentioned that I read was Chuck Negron's book. He really goes in depth of what happened with that group. And it's a pretty dicey, scary story. Lots of drugs, lots of sex, lots of excess that basically helped that group to solve. That's unfortunate, but uh, yeah. at least we have the years they were together. You released the book on the Beatles. Mark Arnold picks on the Beatles in 2016. You review yep. every song ever recorded by the Beatles, group and solo, released and unreleased. Yeah, And an interesting comment in the book, you write about the album Abbey Road, 1969. You write, quote, one of the classic Beatles LPs and actually their true swan song, despite being released before Let It Be, it was actually recorded after. This was the first Beatles LP I ever heard. And I've often wondered what would have happened if I didn't get introduced to the Beatles this way. There are a lot of great Beatles albums, as we know. What is it about this one that stands out to you? My comment mainly was that was what my first exposure where I knowingly knew this is the Beatles. And uh, I was wondering, you know, have I started out like with I want to hold your hand like most people did in the U.S. or even being in England, starting off with Love Me Do or whatever, you know, it's like so I hear their final masterpiece before everything else was everything else a letdown. And it wasn't really. It was just the odd. I will say, though, when I first became a Beatles fan, though, late 70s i tended to gravitate towards the post 1966 albums so i was looking in the sergeant pepper magical mystery tour white album and abbey road let it be and stuff like that and then later i went back to the ones like meet the beatles and all the different u.s variants that were around at the time it took me a while to kind of warm up to it because i thought they were kind of dated little two minute 15 second pop right. ditties well, you know? yeah those <laughs> you know? early songs yeah yeah but now i in fact i've been listening to them again lately the first few albums and it's like yeah they did some good stuff here it's just different that's all that it can be said i think what had happened is they had from 62 to 66 they basically mastered the three minute records yeah. to the point where they did it all there wasn't anything left to do and revolver kind of was the first time where they kind of said, oh, let's expand it a little bit more. I mean, there was previous 
dabblings prior to that in rubber soul and stuff like that. But I mean, when you get to tomorrow never knows, it's like that's no longer a three minute record that's just three guitars and a drums and it's done. You know? Yeah. That album they always say is the yeah. beginning of the classic rock era. That yeah. album was the sound of classic rock. The monkeys. Let's talk the monkey. <laughs> you and Michael A. Ventrella. Right? The yeah. Author. So Michael Ventrella, he's like Charles and me. He published a fanzine about animation years ago called Animato. And again, I didn't know who he was. I just liked getting it because it was about the latest animation news in those days before the internet. Years later, he pointed out that he had purchased my Beatles book. And I go, thanks very much. He goes, would you like to do a book on the monkeys? And at first I balked because I said, I like the monkeys and other people like the monkeys. But I mean, do they really want to know our opinions about the monkeys? I don't know if people really wanted to know the opinions about the Beatles, but in the case of me doing the Beatles book, that was kind of an experiment just to see if I could write something about the Beatles that would be wildly successful. I'll have to say it wasn't. I mean, it, it sold decently, but it's not like, oh, this is my New York Times bestseller. <laughs> you know? Strangely enough, the Monkeys books probably are my, if they're not my most successful books, are probably close to the top. Interesting. You know? Yeah. Okay. So it was a wise choice. Michael convinced me, he says, I'm really into the albums, especially the stuff they did during the 60s, like a lot of fans are. I convinced him to do everything. He just wanted to do like the big songs and everything like that. And I said, no, you got to do everything. Turned out to be the best thing to do because they eventually released everything. There's very little left in the vaults now. So, I mean, the fact that we basically cover everything in the book, I can show the book here. Yeah, all the songs, uh, one by yeah. one. The title of the book, by the way, yeah, the title of the book is Long Title, Looking for the Good Times, Examining the Monkeys' Songs One by One. Yep. Yeah. If you've ordered it before, I will say this. This is the second edition, obviously, because the first one looks a little bit different. Why did we redo it? A couple errors in the first one, not too bad. But the main thing is, after we put out the first edition, Monkeys did one final album. It was the Christmas Party album. So it wasn't covered in the book. And then, unfortunately, David had already passed, then Peter, and then Michael passed, and so uh, Michael Nesmith. And so now with Mickey as a solo, and that everything has pretty much been released out of the vaults, we said, well, let's revise it and update it and correct a few errors and everything, and that'll be the definitive version, unless there's something somewhere that Chip Douglas has claimed he has some tapes that nobody's ever heard if he unearths them someday in his vault in Hawaii, maybe, <laughs> yeah. uh, maybe there might be one long lost monkeys out, but we're kind of thinking this is probably all that they wrote. So we revised the book. So anybody who's bought it before, if they want the complete story and want the Christmas album in there too, that's out there. But yeah, we went through everything and talk about it. Most of the time we agree like Pleasant Valley Sunday, the big hits, whatever last train to Clarksville. Occasionally, we're widely differing in our opinions, but yeah. that's what makes the fun read. So, Well, the, the promo for the book includes a statement I found interesting. It reads, quote, discover the secrets of the recordings. Which of the monkeys played what instruments on each song? How much yep. of what we hear on those classic songs, like I'm a Believer, Last Train to Clarksville, and Daydream Believer, is performed and sung by the band? I believe it was Mike Nesmith who really pushed hard to make what started out as a fake band real. Yeah. Well, that's one thing we did cover. If you get the CDs and the final records that have come out in recent times, they'll list every person who played on every record, even non-monkey people. Hal Blaine doing the drums or whatever. The Wrecking Crew the wrecking people, crew, you know. Yeah. yeah, but we don't list those people. We just assume you know about that. We talk about it in the introduction. We only list monkey involvement on any record. Now, granted, there are a lot of monkeys items that were... The backing track was recorded and there was never vocals recorded. We understand that. So there's a few where it's just about seven or eight tracks lumped together. And they say this was the instrumental backings that were recorded on such and such date. Never had a vocal recorded on it. So there is no monkey involvement. But like I said, we cover everything. It's ranged chronologically by recording date. So the earliest stuff... There's little monkey involvement other than vocals. Slowly over time, and especially by the third album, you get songwriting credits, you get instrumentation. Peter Tork was kind of like Brian Jones and the Rolling Stones. He could play anything. 
He plays banjo, he plays oboe, he plays piano, he plays this, that, and the other. So over time, you see kind of an evolution of, since we did it chronological by song rather than album, just an evolution of how their recordings went on, especially after they became independent and did Headquarters, the Pisces album, and and things so did the, that. So. Did the band members become more and more involved as time went on? Did yeah. it start out as studio musicians helping and then they became the band? Yeah, originally it was all studio stuff, the Wrecking Crew, and then they had their writers like Tommy Boyce, Bobby Hart, Neil Sedaka, Neil Diamond, Carol King, Jerry Goffin, things like that, writing the songs for them. They even told Peter Tork on an early recording session, he brought in his guitar to play. And they said, no, we don't want you to play. And Mickey's singing the lead on this, so we don't even want you to sing on this. So he's gone on record since saying that that's what kind of soured him on the whole monkey thing right at the beginning. Fortunately, later on, because they asserted their independence and got rid of producer Don Kirshner and started to produce their own things or bring in Chip Douglas to produce, then they produced some really fantastic stuff and wrote some fantastic stuff that was under their own personal control. And is it true Stephen Stills auditioned, but they said you can't have the gig because your teeth? Yeah. You don't have good teeth? Yeah. So he <laughs> says, well, I know somebody that has better teeth that looks a lot <laughs> like me, and that was Peter Tork, yeah. Yes. <laughs> now, wow. the one that's not true, the one that's not true, but it's always rumored, is Charles Manson. That's legend. The reality was... Charles Manson actually was in jail during the time that that auditioning process was going on. So he wouldn't have been able to. And by the time he got out, Monkeys was already on the air. And Oh, my God. Charlie anyway, and the Monkeys. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but they like to say that because, I mean, Manson honestly did have connections with Beach Boys and things like that. Right. There's a long involved thing like that. So, sure, why not? The Monkeys, you know, but uh, not true. So let's give you a chance to promote. Uh, I know you have a website, funideas.50webs.com. But yeah, go right. ahead and plug the podcast. Where can people find okay. you online? Well, I mean, I'm on Facebook. I'm on YouTube. I'm on I'm on every social media. I've done a few things on IMDb because I've done some commentaries on some animated DVD releases and things like that. I have a Wikipedia page. Of course, the easiest way to contact me is probably Facebook or if you want to email me at funideas.mark at gmail.com but other than that you can always listen to my podcasts they're all on youtube or they're available the audio versions through itunes and the usual places a lot of great uh, guests on there and the most recent and, one is uh, the the kid from the lassie tv show yeah john provost how i got him was his wife Lori jacobson also wrote a beatles book she wrote a book about shea stadium the shea stadium concert the first one mainly uh, I, I had her on and yeah she was a great interview and somewhere along the line i said can i get your husband john provost oh yeah we'll talk about it it took about a year because he's busy doing convention things and stuff like that but i met up with him again in a convention last summer and she goes yeah we could do it probably near the end of the year so yeah i got him on recently and he's hesitant sometimes to come on the show because some people don't know anything about them and ask dumb questions what's your favorite episode of lassie or something like that and <laughs> i decided well first of all he's written a book called timmy's in the well i did the smart thing of actually reading through the book and taking notes so i could ask good questions and i try to do good research i don't want to just ask the same questions everybody else asks my inspiration is always johnny carson of how to do an interview listen to the guest let them talk don't interrupt and do your homework ahead of time. And if you can do all that, you're halfway there. The rest has to do with the guest hopefully saying something and not just saying yes or no answers. And you probably know this from doing this podcast is like there's some guests that are more difficult than others, but I try to make it look easy. You know, yeah. but there's some I'm like, <laughs> it's only been 15 minutes and I got three minutes. Pulling <laughs> teeth. You know? Yeah. <laughs> you know? But everybody's got a great story. You just got to pull it out of them. Yeah. And some of them just offer it up and all you got to do is ask one question and, that, and off they go. It, it, right. it depends on the guest. But I enjoyed the podcast. I love it. And you're welcome back. Let's have you back on for True. the Turtles yeah. book when that comes out, man. You're welcome yeah. back on. Keep me posted. You, you know yeah. how to reach me. Maybe we come on with Charles on that one. <laughs> oh, that'd be great to have Charles back on again. Thanks, Mark. Okay. Thank you very much, Eric. 
Well now, that was an adventure. That was quite a show you put on today. Well, let me just close this conversation by saying you are one unique individual.